you know, there are a lot of gray areas where you have to kind of weigh good and bad things and decide. There's nobody who's all good. Let me rephrase that. Nobody outside of this room is all good. There are bad things and good things about virtually everybody in the world, except for in here, right? We are all just, right? Yes. Good. You can look a little silly. All right, good. So with that, where are we at? We got Red Clouds War. Um, oh, the tactic. What became the target of the United States Army total war? Yeah, destroy their food, so therefore kill who? What? Yeah, kill the bison, kill them off. Um, let's get, so we got through Fetterman 4, we got Red Clouds War, we got this. Here's the reservation. It's Matt. We did not get to that. Now I'm going to go back to that so we can look at it closely. Closely? <laughs> it's getting closely. Do we get the Treaty of Fort Laramie? Do we get to, I would have, yeah, so the thing was, the Lakota and the Cheyenne won. They won. The United States Army was too expensive. The Army had been reduced in size. They still had reconstruction going on. They basically cut off the Bozeman Trail. Of course, they did not know that the transcontinentals were coming. And when the transcontinentals would get across, they would make, eventually, by the 1870s, line up, it would eventually go to the 1870s. And then the Northern Pacific's coming. But this was a victory. But Red Cloud, knowing that there are so many people from the United States, he agreed to a treaty of looking back at it. It seemed to him like a victory, but it wasn't. The Fort Laramie Treaty, 1868, would say that there's going to be a massive reservation. And pretty much 60% uh, of South Dakota will become Sioux territory. Lakota City. And not it's not just that, not just that reservation. Now I'll tell you about the grasshoppers. Oh good. That's that's they would get all of this. The Black Hills would be off limits to the United States. And this area here in kind of orange that would be ceded to the various tribes. Now they're not going to live there, but in the summer they're allowed to go there and hunt. And in the winter, they would be cared for by the United States government. That means food and shelter provided by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We'll get to them in a sec. And so the Bureau of Indian Affairs would buy food and supply food in the, in the winter. They can hunt this summer if they want or stay on the reservation being cared for. And how long would they be cared for? Zero. Huh? Zero. Zero years, zero months, zero days. But no, how long did the treaty say? How long did the treaty say? Forever. So I know what you're saying, but actually kind of, but we'll get to what's going to happen there. And so that was the idea. And so it looked like a victory to Red Cloud. He didn't see it as a victory, but he also understood, as a lot of them did, the United States is coming, and they're going to take everything. They will take everything, and they want everything. There was a few, like Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, We'll get to them in one second who refused and they just stayed out here. They call them winter wanderers. They stayed out here the whole time. But then the thing is, the Northern Pacific is coming and surveying crews are starting to come through this way. And one other thing happened. Remember the Black Hills. In 1874, gold was discovered in the Black Hills. And that will trigger what the United States is going to call the Great Sioux War. And it's basically, yeah. Were off limits. How they Very good question. Well, the United States, even though left out, um, left it off limits, they sent an exp ex expedition protected by the 7th U.S. Cavalry. Yes. Yes. But they claimed it was a mapping expedition, but they were looking through it. And they heard there was gold there. They looked through it. And it was supposed to be secret. Here is Custer with Crow Scouts. Um, as they went through here, remember I told you the Crow, the United States would use them as scouts and a few others to fight the Lakota, their mortal enemy, remember, divide and conquer. And they were supposed to keep it secret. But of course it got out. In fact, Custer was a publicity hound. He brought reporters with him and they told they discovered gold. That's going to trigger a gold rush. Thousands of people are going to move into the Black Hills. And there was gold, not a huge amount, but gold. They're coming at, and this was at a time of an economic depression. So all these people came in, they violated the treaty, 
and the United States government basically tried to redo the treaty. So we have another treaty, which is kind of what happened after the treaty of Greenville in 1894. Same kind of thing. Well, we violated the treaty, and we'll make you write a new one. Well, the Lakota were split, but thousands of Lakota, along with Cheyenne, um, that's in a one other tribe, they said the heck with it. And they went into this open air again. They went into that ceded territory and the heck with it in the winter of 1875. And that's when the United States basically made a reversal. Okay, we're going to force you back. This was seen as humiliating for the United States, and they were going to just arbitrarily say, you can't do that anymore. And so the Lakota and Cheyenne, along with this bison range, said, you can't do this. So the United States was violating the treaty. Now, you could argue that those who went out that winter were violating it, but it's a matter of degrees, isn't it? And eventually it's close to maybe six to 7,000. I mean, you think about the Great Plains with the lack of food and water, especially for nomadic tribes, this was a massive number. And they were mostly in groups, but they would begin to come together that spring. A little more food in the spring, following a herd. They also noticed one more thing. The herd was getting noticeably small. Noticeable. And that's when the United States ended their peace project, a grant with a tiny U.S. Army, but still it's going to order a mass three-pronged assault to force not only the, those tribes who went off onto the, the wander or the uh, unceded territory, it was called, but also force them to fight. Because one of the things that the various tribes would do, you know, the Comanches did it all over the Lakota, the Cheyenne, they saw a larger force coming, they would just disperse. Because they knew they couldn't match them up, match the United States Army in, um, you know, they were outnumbered, they have the weaponry, but they could do hit and run attacks. And so their plan was, if you see them fight, you've got to fight, attack them. And so the fear was they would always run away. So there's going to be a column under a general by the name of Terry, under a colonel by the name of Gibbon, coming from what is now Bozeman, Fort Shaw. Gibbon was a Civil War hero. And another Civil War hero under General Crook from here. So basically three pawned. And this wing right here, when it got to the Rosebud Creek, sent the 7th Cavalry under their second in command, George Custer, who was a lieutenant colonel, in the Civil War, he had a temporary rank of Major General, the youngest Major General in American history. But when the, they called it the Brevet rank, but when the Army shrunk, they didn't need as many generals. So a lot of those people who were generals, they lost rank. He went down to Lieutenant Colonel, even though everyone called them General. This happened to a lot of people. Crook was a general, he's a Colonel, even first. Well, he went down the Rosebrud towards a little big one, there's a range of mountains right here, to find this group. They knew they were there. Thousands, they didn't know how many thousands. He had about 400 men in the 7th U.S. Cavalry, which is horsemen. He could have brought, have you heard of something called a Gatling gun? Seven barrels, fired about 200 rounds a minute, jammed a lot. Too heavy and bring it along with him. Yeah. No, but over half strong. Yeah. And so with that, so we're coming to the battle a little bit. We can't go into details of all of this. We can't go into all, obviously we can't talk about all the details of the battle, but customer and stuff was going, based on the patrol to find him. When he heard there was an encampment, he ordered an attack. And it was a very just pell-mell thing. He divided his unit up into essentially four groups. And he knew the encampment was big. He didn't realize that it was over 6,000 people. That meant there might be as many as 1,500 to 2,000 fighters. He was way outnumbered. His basic plan was the forces with him, a little bit less than half of his men, would sweep into the camp and take the women and children hostage and the forces surrender of everybody else. That was his plan. This was not an uncommon plan. And horrible. Absolutely despicable. Take the women, children, and the elderly as the men, the men were the fighters. Well, the two of the leaders of the Lakota and the Cheyenne, there are many, 
One was Crazy Horse. We don't know what he looked like. He would never allow his picture to be taken. So there are many paintings of him. That's why if you go to the Black Hills, who's anyone been to the Black Hills? A couple people. You go to the Mount Rushmore. I always go to Mount Rushmore. You go to Crazy Horse Mount Rushmore, which is further south. They're they get they're guessing what he looked like. Crazy Horse Memorial is pretty amazing too. It's huge. Yeah, it's massive. It's really unreal. Uh, if you get a chance, Black Hills, that's really neat, but it's very touristy. Well, Crazy Horse, probably one of the, the great fighters. He was one of those who was at Phil, Phil Carney, the Red Clouds. And here's Sitting Bull. By then, he was pretty old. He was not really able to fight very much anymore. He was at, he was at that age. So he was very much of a kind of a political and spiritual leader, but he had an animosity very well deserved against the United States. He was known for his bravery. He would fight the survey crews for the railroad and for his whole life, um, tried to fight the United States, never gave in really. And Custer's forces were overwhelmed by massive numbers. And everybody who was with Custer would be killed. Everybody was with Custer. Half of them would survive because he broke his army up. They, he broke his unit up. And approximately half, a little bit less than half of all of Custer's forces. Custer and his men would be surrounded. This is called Monument or, or Custer Hill. That's where his body was found. That's the next day as the United States forces or the rest of the army arrived. Here is a picture done by a Lakota. This is done in Standing Rock Reservation in, in South Dakota in the 1890s. But his vision of it and the battle, at least part of customers didn't happen like that. That's one mini conscious Sue said something to the effect of it happened as long as it takes a hungry man to eat his dinner. That's pretty descriptive. That's not right. And these are some of the bones of the horses and the men after the fact. They're buried essentially where they lay, but they've been going through the, the battlefield, the park service. And they've been changing where the where they think the, the men died, both uh that some idea where the cavalry died, but the bodies were pretty mutilated after the battle. It's harder to tell where various tribal members died, but we're getting a much different view of the battle. Has anyone been to the battle? So it's just a few of us. They've done a remarkable job. It's really neat. The only problem I have with this is that a rattlesnake struck at me and was just a few feet away. And I was, that was disconcerting. And ever since then, I'm kind of scared to go. I've had rattlesnakes strike at me before, but no. But it made the one. It's just not for me to do And when it's that close, that's close. I've had other ones where they kind of, like, but it's been like 10 feet away. And uh, so don't get bit by a rattlesnake. Yes. Bit by a rattlesnake? Yeah, no. I I've eaten rattlesnake. And it tastes like a chicken. Oh, did he? Yeah, oh, that's good. Man. Yeah, that ain't anti venom. Has anyone got picked by a rattlesnake? I would recommend not. It's fun and romantic, as I might sound. And snakes are weird. I don't like snakes. I don't care what anyone says. Have you seen a snake move? They don't have legs. It's kind of wiggly thing. It's wrong. It's just wrong. Don't defend snakes. Yes. What are you supposed to bring? Okay, yeah, quick run. And so, one thing about Custer, a lot of the myth that's going to come of this last stand, the Anheuser Bush company sent these signs to bars all, all over that the brand, the brand of the new Anheuser Bush company, now it's part of a massive beverage company called what, InBev or something like that, a holding company, but have the dramatic last stand of Custer and with a long, golden hair. They always made a big deal about that, which of course wasn't true. They cut their hair short their own campaign. But this really set this thing of Custer's last stand. When I was in high school, I was it was taught still as Custer's last stand. Which, wait, what are you talking about? It wasn't like this Custer was fighting off these evil invaders. It was the other way around in many ways. And it's the battle of the little big one. But I do highly recommend going. And of course, then it would kind of go back and say Custer was this irrational, horrible soldier. No, that's not quite true either. But myth, a lot of myths about this battle. Since we live in Montana, we have a, a lot of those. 
um, years ago, one time we went to my special topics class here. And it was fun. The problem was uh, there was some, uh, a lot of bus and staying issues. And so I don't know. I haven't done it since. Sorry. Then, uh, maybe I'll look at it again. It was uh, things out of my hand. I was a, it, it just didn't work as well as I wanted. So after this, oh, let's go back to the date. Did you catch the date? So by the time a steamboat, which was kind of a big deal, went up the, the little thing, which was a pretty shallow river, and was able to make it there a few days after the battle, brought some of the wounded back towards Fort Abraham Lincoln, which is near present-day present Bismarck. So they could steamboat chuck down a few days after the battle, the chuck, 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 chuck to here. That's where the nearest telegraph line was, and then it was spread throughout, so it got the newspapers the next day. Anybody want to guess what day it arrived all along the East Coast in newspapers every day? And think about July 4th, 1876. Now, that's not just any July 4th. It's the what? Yeah, the centennial, 100th anniversary. They had all these celebrations and then their worst defeat. One of the worst defeats in American military history. Are, it's probably not the worst, but it's pretty darn close. But a humiliating defeat. Custer was incredibly well known. The worst large defeat is probably November 1950 during the Korean War, when the Chinese attacked American forces, and it was wow, it's a fact. So back to this. So the United States decided to destroy this. Literally, they sent thousands more troops. They built cantonments and eventually forts all over Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming. South Dakota, including Fort Keogh, which would around it would become my own city, my hometown. And they began a winter campaign to run them down. Um, these are Crook's forces in what is uh, right about here. But the, the massive encampment had to break up because of food and also to escape. And group by group, they got run into the ground. And the winter campaign attacking in the winter destroyed the Lakota. They didn't really destroy them so much as and defeat them every time, but every time they attacked a winter camp, they couldn't bring their food. With them. They had to give something up. Finally, they just all had to be forced to the reservation. And now the reservations, it went from this massive reservation in unceded territory to these. That's it. Some of the land is good, some of the land is bad, but the big thing now is they're all hemmed in and forced all the way around to make sure the Lakota can't do it again. And there's no treaty now. They are just forced onto these troops, onto this reservation. And the numbers, about half would die of the Lakota. And the numbers are going to drop very fast out of the battle. Now, after that winter campaign, I should say Crazy Horse did bring his, his uh, people followers into Pine Ridge. And it was decided by the United States. First said we wouldn't arrest him, but then they figured he's too much of a threat. And in the process of trying to arrest Crazy Horse in this reservation and send him to jail, he was murdered. So that's why we do not know what Crazy Horse looked like. He was murdered. Yes. Well, I know what you're saying, but it was meant to be a compliment. But we all, we have our definition of crazy today. Yeah. Um. But in 1877, the very year that the Lakota were basically run down, and then the same with the Northern Cheyenne, there's a, tri a tribe in what is uh, here, the Nez Piers, and they had by treaty the land right here. And without the Nez Piers, the core discovery would never have made it, for example. So they helped them. And I guess this is the way to repay them. They decided the treaty is now void and they're going to be forced onto a reservation out of the um, Walla Walla Valley here into here, a reservation they never lived, at least three quarters of it. Most just agreed to go, a few resisted, saying, We have a treaty. And the United States said, We don't care. You're going to this reservation, which was not as good land. And what happened was in a conflict over this, some settlers nearby. Basically, there was a conflict with various young men, and a settler was killed, and the United States 
the army was nearby, decided to force the rem remnants on to this reservation. Those who survived decided to make a break for it with the ultimate goal of going to Canada. Sitting Bull ran away to Canada. He would come back. It did not work out there for me. But he, that, and so they thought they couldn't go to Canada. The problem is they couldn't go this way because the mountains and U.S. forces, U.S. Army was right here. They advanced into Montana. Actually, actually They defeated a bunch of Yehu militia at low, low pass right here. But then at the big hole, they defeated a powerful U.S. Army force under a very confident, sympathetic to the Nez Perce, but confident general by the name of John Gibbon, hero of West Point. Almost forgot. Chief Joseph was one of many leaders of this small little group of less than 200, maybe less than 100 fighters, but they were some of the best fighters. Maybe her person. Hard to find a more, uh, better military force than these Nez Perce. They defeated forces three times their size, well-led forces. Chief Joseph was kind of their political leader. He had the Nez Perce haircut, kind of a pompadour. That was the style, the religious style. So it looked very much like a 50s rock star. I can't help it. Whenever I see Nez Perce, I think of Elvis Presley. But I can't help it. And that's not meant to be. I just, I, that's the way my mind works. And Joseph would be a very effective political leader. They won here, but they were so small they had to keep running. They ran across the very new, brand new Yellowstone National Park, and then went up, defeated another force near a little tiny town called uh, Colston, which would soon become Billings, and made its way just here, but hesitated in the Bear Paw Mountains, hesitated. And at the Bear Paw, they were caught. But newspaper stories in the East, the trade in Nez Pierce, it went from being the savages who were murdering settlers, which of course was a garbage way to look at it, to more like the noble savage. And there was a lot of sympathy for the Nez Pierce in the East Coast. And this would change some political views. I'm not saying for the better, just change views towards American Indians. But you can also see this as very condescending and racist. They're not people defending the land that they lived on. They're now noble savages. And that became a term used a lot. So that's a, like, oh, they're defending the land. I feel sympathy for them. But they're still savages. Chief Joseph would be arrested, naturally sent down to the, um, down to the Florida Keys to a prison dug into the coral reef there even though he was promised not to be sent there, but eventually be allowed. He would actually die in Oklahoma. That's what they said. He never was able to go back to his people. Yeah. Do you know the big trouble of the famous Lord in the baby? They thought he was such a threat that they wanted one day. Even though the nesters, he could never do this again. Yeah, it just fooled me. So that's the saga of the nesters. Those are... Nez Pierce, this is after the battle. But the Bureau of Indian Affairs ran the reservation. And the leader, the, where each individual reservation, it, it was a political appointee for the president, would be called an Indian agent. But they were infamous. They ran the reservations, but they were infamous for corruption. And graft is a term for stealing from the government. Indian agents were given money to buy food, uh, uh, materials for shelter, etc. And a lot of times they would pocket the money, either give nothing or give substandard, you know, local quality or even rotten food. A lot of the Lakota talk about it's the first time they were ever hungry was on the reservations when they were promised, promised food and protection. Part of the reason they left the reservation in 1775, 1875, 1876 was that they weren't being fed. And now you take the Black Hills, the heck with them, we're leaving. Custer was actually almost court-martialed because he tried to expose Indian agents when they're not doing their duty. And part of the reason why he was so desperate for a victory is because he was trying to get his name from under this black flag. And so the, on the reservations by the late 1880s, it was absolute misery. 
And the story was those on the reservation had significantly more relatives and friends amongst the dead. It was just pure misery, grieving, hopelessness. And that is why the saddest religion I've ever heard would take, it started in 1888, but started sweeping in 1889 and 1890, called the ghost dance religion. Well, Volca, who's a Paiute Indian from some further south, He'd also spent time in the missionary school, so he had a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Paiute religion. He combined it to a religion that if you believed hard enough, we can go back to the way it was before. Your relatives will come back. The buffalo will come back. And just as importantly, people from the United States will come back. And it soon became, how do you prove that you're worshiping hard enough? A very elaborate dance. And there were, every Plains Indian tribe had, um, had a sun dance, was one of the most important dances. In fact, they did a massive sun dance on the battle, a little bighorn. But this is an elaborate ghost dance shirts. This is the shirt from, this is actually at the Little Bighorn Museum. It's a very good museum. They did a good job. But how's it located? It was all glorification of, of posture, but it turned into a very good job. Here's Wavolka right here. It was actually starting to die down by 1890, but it spread like wildfire. A little bit left to finish tomorrow, sound good? Hey, you gotta do the test tomorrow. I ready. Part two, hey, don't forget. Think about if you do, if enough of you wanna do Thursday, come, you know, tell me you do, and I'll do Thursday too. We're not doing Okay. On my YouTube screen is the Pro Football Hall of Fame screen. And just like just the like, 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 like,